Live from Business Sweden Studio One in Stockholm, Sweden. My name is Emre Gürler and welcome to today's webinar about the North American outdoor market. During this hour, we will be joined by leading Swedish outdoor brands, Haglops and Hilleberg, the tent maker, who will take us along their journeys in North America and give us their best tips from first-hand experience. And you will also meet Scandinavian Outdoor Group and my colleague Elma, who has spearheaded Business Sweden's work within the outdoor industry and together with her team in Canada and the US spent the fall thinking about how Swedish brands can approach and of course succeed in the North American market. We unfortunately won't have time for any live questions since we have a packed hour, but we would love to get your input on how we best can support you and what your burning questions might be. And uh, after this webinar, you will get a thank you email with a form to fill out, which I mean, which activities support you are interested in and a link to sign up a free one hour coaching session with the Business Sweden team to discuss your key questions and future plans for the North American market. So let's introduce our first guest, Elma, who's, uh, who's my colleague based in California. Um, Elma is our project manager at Business Sweden, uh, focused on helping Swedish outdoor brands succeed in the US and Canada, and has been driving the outdoor campaign this year together with her team in North America. Elma. Hi there, thank you for having us, Emre, and super excited to see so many Swedish brands represented here today. We have some really interesting companies in Sweden and super excited to follow all of your journeys. So let's start off with the first question, Elma. What are, I mean, the most common questions or, or challenges you hear from Swedish brands that you encounter? Yes, yeah, so I would say if we're looking at over the last few months and the conversations I've been involved in, it's changed very much from what we heard early on in 2022. Of course, the snow less winter in, in the US and uh, Canada has definitely affected orders coming in. There has been cancellations. We know that uh, a lot of Swedish brands have been struggling uh, when it comes to sales in the last few months. Uh, so that's definitely been one of those things that we've been discussing, how to really reach through. Um, secondly, we're still seeing a lot of Swedish brands having problems with their supply chain. Of course, this is a, a issue that has been ongoing for years. But I also think that right now that we're post everything, there's a lot of companies really reconsidering nearshoring, where, of course, Europe is, is one alternative. But we're also seeing a lot of more interest in nearshoring to the Americas. So I would say that uh, those two uh, things are what most of my conversations are around right now. Mm. Thank you. I mean, uh, what's the secret of the, uh, what's the state of the North, Amer North American outdoor market? How has the industry been affected by the pandemic and what are the biggest trends you see at the moment? Yeah, so if we're thinking about right now the state of U.S. economy, we did see a decline in December of general retail spend around 1%, although the sporting industry um, saw somewhat unchanged values. Um, and it was a lot of worry coming into 2023. We, we are seeing that there, the decline has not continued and inflation is uh, still going quite strong uh, right now in the U.S., so I would say that the concerns we had economically, they might not be there, although we're seeing it on, on the retailers still. I would say that it's not a Swedish problem. A lot of the big brands such as Columbia and other American uh, outdoors brands are experiencing the same with cancellation of orders. Even on the retailer side, the biggest player or one of the, the big players, REI, has been laying off 8% of their headquarters uh, staff. So there's a lot of going on right now, a lot of uncertainty. Um, but if we're leaving, you know, the, the financial parts of things, I would say that there's still, as a Swedish brand, there's always that thinking of, Am I building the market or am I taking shares from others from the market? And there's still a lot of cake left on the table for, for Swedish brands, right? 
um, there's so many steps before this general thing will, will be the one thing that will affect most uh, brands. Thank you very much. And I would say that, that oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. No, I would, I would say if we're looking at trends in general, I think a lot of Swedish brands should be aware of inclusiveness as well as Gen Z's trends, right? So if we're looking at the Gen Z, uh, more than half of them are saying that they are willing to pay more for sustainability. If we're looking at what CEOs are doing right now, more than half of them are saying that their biggest priority in 2023 is to cut costs. So there's definitely places here for those brands that are willing to take lead in, for example, sustainability things. I think another thing I'm noticing a lot is companies want to come to California here where I live, but it's also 40% of the population in California is Hispanic. And I'm just, a lot of people have not yet tr tried to really take advantage of that in their marketing material, for example. So lots of, uh, lots of trends. Uh, and um, I would say that even a thing such as 66% of females in the US are size 14 or larger, that is an XL in, in um, European sizing. Like being more inclusive are things that the big players such as REI are really taking in a lot and discussing. So you should be discussing it back home in Sweden as well if you want to be here. Really interesting. Thank you very much, Elma. And I would like to also invite David, who is the secretar secretar Secretary General of Scandinavian Outdoor Group, a member association with more than 70 outdoor brands from the Scandinavian countries. Welcome, David. Thank you. Uh, very David. nice to be here. <laughs> Great. David, I know that the uh, uh, Scandinavian Outdoor Group are keeping an extra eye on the North American uh, market at the moment. How come North America is a pro priority right now at the moment? I mean, I think we're trying to keep an eye on uh, all markets, but uh, I would say the North American one is kind of easy to at least try to understand and see, especially because of language. Uh, that's not as big hassle as uh, elsewhere, like Asia and also Europe. Uh, so in, in many ways, I think uh, it's, it's easy to understand, but then I wouldn't say it's, it's not as easy to penetrate as you might, might think. Yeah, thank you. I mean, is there any specific area that uh, your members are more focused on? Areas in, in terms of uh, geographic areas or, uh, yeah, or in, general. In, in what way? Yeah, in general. Uh, not 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 really that I'm that I'm aware of. I'm I'm representing the big organization in terms of brands. Uh, we don't have insights in in the goal for for each uh, in, in each company in in that way. But uh, there's there's such a huge market, uh, and we also have a very diverse type of brands in uh, Scandinavian Outdoor Group. So. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are, yeah, targeting many, many aspects of uh, uh, of North America. But it's very interesting that Alma just said with the Hispanic uh, uh, parts, which I don't think is as much in focus at, uh, as it might should be. Because that's a, a really, really interesting topic, regardless when it comes to business worldwide. Worldwide, I mean. Yeah. I mean, David, what are other key questions for your member brands when thinking about expanding sales in the US and Canada? Um, I do think uh, one main thing that uh, is uh, pretty well written in the auto report from uh, Business Sweden as well is how to, how to enter and how to go into the market. If you should use distribution, sales reps, uh, mm -hmm. agents, uh, uh, by yourself and also how to handle the logistics. So I think that's a big, big uh, question for, for many brands. And uh, I'm very interested to hear the, the stories from Hilleberg and, and Hagler today, how they have uh, penetrated the market, because I think that's a big learning uh, thing for, for many companies. And 
I, I'm sure many of them have, many brands have tried and uh, and failed, uh, and then you hesitate again to to try it again. So it's uh, it's very nice to see uh, Business Sweden now put focus on the very special outdoor industry we have in Sweden and and Scandinavia in terms mm -hmm. of uh, very exciting brands. Most definitely. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and now, as you as you just said, we have Hoglabs here in the studio in Stockholm. So, I mean, we also have two two different uh, companies here as well. Hoglabs is one of them, and here in the studio beside me is Daniel Stellerkun. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, export manager at Hoglofs uh, will now share his journey of building up the, the, the entire Hoglof brand in the North American market. Welcome the, once again. Thank you so much. It's a lot of pressure on my shoulders <laughs> <what you say>. <laughs> <laughs> to build up the brand in the entire North American market. Yeah, yeah I mean, it is a massive market yeah. and that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how did you get started with Hoglofs and uh, end up in charge of, of the entire North American expansion? Start. I mean, let's start from yeah, there. Yeah, I mean that that is a very interesting uh, question, honestly, because a lot of people that get asked, "Do you want to tackle the North American market?" might feel a little bit uncomfortable because the, in general, the North American culture, sorry, the, the U.S. culture, the business culture in the U.S. is totally different from what we have here in in, in Sweden. Uh, but when I got the question a couple of years ago, if I would like to be in charge of the North American market, mainly on the US market, I felt that uh, a small boy in me was like, yeah, let's do this. Uh, let's conquer the world. Uh, so, and and the, the, why, the reason why I felt this is probably because I'm so proud of this company mm. of Hoglis. We are unique. Of course, every brand is unique in their own personal way. Mm. But I can really feel, uh, together with all of my colleagues, that we have something really special. Mm. Uh, has it been easy to, to penetrate? I don't like to, uh, like to use the word penetrate, but has it been easy for us to enter the US and Canadian market? No, mm. it is still super difficult. Mm. But nevertheless, they asked me a couple of years ago and I said yes, and it be, it's been a a lot of traveling, a lot of late night calls together with you guys, but also with retailers, mm. PR agencies, local influencers, mm. people at the local trade shows, everyone to figure out how to execute and where to play. And now I've been working as an export manager for three years and now I'm trying to use the same kind of mentality in Asia, where I'm also focusing on, but during this call, it's it's mainly on. on I mean, that's a really. I'm, I could go on for for another hour just talking about that market. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm really curious. How do you start from scratch building up a brand in a in a totally new market as you did? Yeah. Um, well, pretty much, it's a blank canvas. You no, know, but but the thing is that I mean, first of all, Sweden as a brand mm. is extremely strong, mm. right? In what Every, sense? Uh, we stand for credibility. I mean, we have m huge companies like H&M, Volvo, Spotify, Ericsson, mm. Saab to, mm. to one extent mm. as well. Mm. So we have so many strong brands that is sort of like a door opener for us. So when I enter a new discussion saying that I'm, I'm a Swedish brand mm. uh, and already there, the word Sweden mm. is so vital for the discussion going forward because that also mm. says that the Swedish way of uh, business mindset and culture stands for so much more than just the brand I'm representing and that for me I didn't figure that one out in the beginning but then after a while after a lot of meetings the key takeaway was use your heritage say that you're a brand coming from Sweden and that will be a much more easier discussion. Really, really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's talk about, from heritage, let's talk about marketing strategies. Yeah. Uh, how do you adopt your marketing to the vast North American market? And how do you raise awareness of the brand in a new market with some really intense competition? Yeah, uh, I'm going to give you a lot of answers. So please ask the question again <laughs> if I lost track here. Um, but first of all, 
so we as a company have a history that is more than 100 years, right? We have been doing a lot of different initiatives along the way, as you do, uh, but we need to be dynamic. Uh, but with that said, when you're entering the North American market, you really need to stay true to your core values. My recommendation for every brand, every brand that wants to enter US, don't think that you should change your marketing strategy just because it's US, because then you will just become another brand that are adopting to everything. But talking about what Elma mentioned, the different Hispanic, et cetera, et cetera, that is another discussion, right? The diversity part. Exactly. Uh, but for us, when it comes to marketing, it's all about staying true to our core values. And the same way that we're marketing the brand here in Scandinavia, we should do it in the same way over in US and Canada, because then you have the alignment between the countries. So if a US citizen goes to, to Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, they will recognize the type of marketing for us instead of having a local marketing made for US only. I get it. Uh, so that is one thing that is very important and one of my biggest recommendations. Uh, have consistency in your marketing. Don't be too flexible just because retailers or whatever are saying that you need to be flexible. Because as soon as you start being that, they will ask for more. And then you will lose track of your core foundation. Really interesting. So, so that's, that's one answer. <laughs> <laughs> really interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I can go on for, for uh, another hour just speaking about this, but let's move on to the next episode of our webinar. And uh, we have, uh, I'd say last but not least, we've got Petra from Hille Bay, the tent maker, who's, uh, who spent the last 20 years on the US West Coast building the brand to the current success it is today. So warm welcome, uh, Petra. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so let's see here. Hilleberg is a, is a family company from Sweden. And I mean, how did you end up in uh, Seattle as the CEO? And what have been the most significant milestones on your journey? Well, uh, I said to my dad when I was about 12 years old that I was going to sell tents in the US. <laughs> so um, he said, yes, of course you are. Uh, but so I ended up uh, going to college here uh, in the U.S. and then started the business actually at the very same time as I was graduating. So I started uh, and set up a small one person office in 2000. Uh, and I had everything uh, with the warehouse and everything in my own little uh, tiny little office. And uh, so I did everything. The strategy was always to start going uh, direct. Um, I had hoped to have reps at the beginning, but being a um, unknown high priced brand, there is no reps that were interested, which was really turned out to be a really, really good thing. Um, because obviously if you use reps, they take a, a certain percentage of margin, at least 10%, right? So, um, and then as I went on after a few years, uh, the first retailer approached us and wanted to sell our product. Um, and I said, yes. And that's basically how, be, how we've kept working um, through the years mm -hmm. that we would sell direct, so about 50% direct. And then with a few select retailers throughout the country. And uh, we only work directly with them. And um, I, th I think as far as milestones, um, I don't look at it that way. I think everything happened really fast when I started it. Um, it has just been a continuous work uh, journey with uh, building the brand. I took over as CEO from my dad in 2016 uh, of the Hilberg Group, which includes the office in Sweden and the office here in Seattle, and then also our factory in Estonia. And then in 2018, I took over as president of the office in Sweden as well, so that we can really align the whole business that we're all working together towards the same goal. Yeah, really interesting journey indeed. I mean, could you walk us through your strategy and what works for Hilleberia? I think that uh, really focusing on one thing, which is making the very, very best product that we can. And that has always been the strategy since my dad started 52 years ago uh, and that's kind of I agree with uh, Hoglifts that you don't change your your um, your branding or your marketing based on the market uh, to me I think a customer is the same no matter where they are in the world 
obviously some changes depending on products, I guess, sizing and things like that for, for clothing. But if someone is outside in a cold, wet night, they're going to need the same things no matter where they are, whether they're in Sweden, mm. um, Japan, or the U.S. So that core uh, is the same. So as long as you focus on what really is needed uh, and you don't jump on trends or fads or anything like that, then then it's very easy to stay focused. And then the customer is there and the customer is the same. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, what? Uh, what's the biggest difference, would you say, between American and Swedish customers? So I would say that there isn't, if you look at it, uh, and that might be a lot of people are going to argue with me about that one. But I really don't think at the core it's the same, right? Um, people travel in a similar way. Uh, yes, there is more climate differences here. There's more uh, hot weather, um, more cold weather. The one thing that we have seen uh, that is a new customer category for us that is actually huge for us is backpack hunters. Um, in Sweden, a hunter will usually go out, sit on a pass, and then come back home in the evening. Whereas mm. here, um, a hunter might have a 15-year plan that they spend with the lotteries and like all the different things that they have to do. And then once they get that hunt of a lifetime, they're out for 15 days and everything depend on their depends on their night and like their equipment and their gear to get that hunt that they've had. So that has been a really interesting market that we kind of happen upon by accident because they really, really need the gear, the quality uh, gear. And there was a underserved market in the outdoor industry. Now it's changed because uh, even uh, hunting brands have realized that they maybe should come with the times a little bit and like new use materials that work and lighter equipment and things like that. But that's a very interesting market that we don't really have uh, as much and they spend a lot of money. I mean, it's uh, it's really interesting. Uh, you said something about uh, the differences between climates. Had that put a stress on your products uh, in any in any kind? Uh, put a stress on it. Uh, sand and sun will always put a stress on a product, but that's. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but no, uh, we make all season tents, so it it will work in all seasons. Um, there, obviously, people thinking we are from northern Sweden, so there we had some challenges, and and there are. Our products are not always the best choice for the very hottest climates, but um, they're usually if you're in a hot climate, the night will be really cold. So it kind of depends. So we we serve all those markets as well. Great, thank you. I mean, I've noticed that your uh, products are not yet in Can in Canada. How come? Uh, there's a flame retardancy standard in Canada that. Um, most products actually don't meet. So Canada is a very interesting market. It has uh, some of the highest um, um, requirements when it comes to uh, chemicals, but at the same time, it also has a uh, highest requirement when it comes to flame retardancy and things like that. Uh, for a while, they changed all their, so there was not a single tent on the market that met their requirements. Um, not just ours, there's uh, none of them. So that's something, I've been an industry group working um, on this for like 20 years, I think. Um, there are There's some progress and there are, technically we could sell now, but we are sold out. So we're not looking at new markets at this very moment, but we can technically sell in Canada, but we're not doing it right now. I understand, thank you very much. Uh, the Thanks. next, the point uh, in our today's webinar is uh, we're going to have uh, questions to both Petra and Daniel. So I'll, I'll start asking uh, where do you have most of your customers and, and most of your sales? I can start with you here in the studio, uh, Daniel. Yep. So in the in, in US, it's mainly um, along the Rockies, uh, meaning the states of Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. And then it's a sidestep to Washington where, where Petra is at in Seattle. So here you have the biggest 
core audience when it comes to the outdoor industry in the US in general, but what we're now starting to see based on feedback from, from retailers is that where you have the biggest amount of customers that pays the most amount of money for our products are either based in California and San Francisco and also up in New York where you have the tech industry, you have the big financial you know, institutes, the banks and everything. Mm -hmm. So the core audience for us is in the Rockies, uh, but the highest uh, amount of spending on an individual product in general comes from the East Coast or the West Coast along New York and California. Petra, what do you say? Uh, same thing, really. I was in nor Northwest, uh, California, uh, Rockies, uh, the coasts. Uh, but um, for us, uh, people on, in other areas travel more, and that's obviously something we've seen, um, especially in the hunting category. Uh, they travel to the West uh, to go, but, but that's obviously, that's where the population centers are, and that's where the outdoor centers are as well, I'd say. I mean, what, what, to both of you, was this... Uh... Was, was that your original expectation or, or is it a surprise for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, f for me, I always uh, had uh, knowledge regarding New York and how strong from a financial perspective it is there when you look at the average income, et cetera, et cetera. I'm more surprised regarding California and that had happened during the latest couple of years with the tech industry booming like crazy mm -hmm. and we're seeing the same trend up in Seattle where you have this massive amount of Google is so have their uh, super big office up there you have Boeing so you have this massive industries that have a raised up the the minimum uh, salary for individuals mm. uh, so that is more of a surprise but if you look at the climate I mean up on the west coast the Pacific Northwest it's spot on compared to the kind of climate we have here in Sweden so uh, but yeah it's it's not a surprise anymore but a couple of years ago, I was caught off guard. Mm. Petra, what about you? Was this, uh, I mean, was that I would say traditionally, yeah. it's always, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. It, was it a, I mean, is it a surprise for you at all? Mm, um, not really. The traditional, the outdoor hubs that were always looked at was really Boulder, Colorado, and Seattle. That's where most brands were drawn to. Now, obviously, there's a more... Um, that are based in California and uh, Montana around Bozeman. But those are really the, the, the hubs where you see most brands. Uh, there's some around Salt Lake, but, but that's kind of where the climate and the, the populations are. I mean, let's talk about challenges. I mean, what was the biggest challenge for you, for example? The biggest challenge for us, since we didn't have a distributor in place, we didn't have local sales reps like Petro is talking about, we didn't have a subsidiary in US. So it was pure boots on the ground. It was me traveling around, knocking on doors, making calls, reaching out on LinkedIn. You know, I had so many, I put together a list of, you know, uh, the dream list. It was more than 300 retailers. And I was like, wow. Jesus, where, where do I start, you know? Uh, yes, we are a brand that has a lot of heritage and a proven track record here in Europe and also in Asia. So I thought this should be a <laughs> walk in the park. Uh, I was dead wrong. It was not a walk in the park. But the thing is that with, with I think it's the same with every market. When you don't have any retailer that is part of your partnership, it's always harder to get another one. So you just need to get the first one and that will double up to the second one and that will equal up to the fourth and the eighth and the twelfth, et cetera, et cetera. But the biggest challenge for us was how do we get the time with the buyers? Why should they talk with us instead of the majors like the local brands in the US that are already performing extremely good? So what can we bring to the table? And going back to where it all started is the uniqueness of the brand, it's the heritage. Um, we were talking about sustainability in the, in, the, in the intro here. For us, it's more about the responsibility. I think it's sustainability is a word that everyone is using uh, and pretty much no one knows exactly what it's all about. Um, you can give your version, I can give my version, sure, sure. but responsibility, mm -hmm. it's a better way to narrow it down to make it more sense. And then if you want to find out more, happy to talk about it. And we're also seeing the same thing in, in US, uh, that retailers are now demanding that you need 
to meet their sustainability or responsibility uh, um, uh, limitations that they have. So for us, in the beginning, to answer your question again, uh, talking about the uniqueness, our heritage, and also the responsibility that we can bring to the table. What about, what about you, Petra? What was your biggest challenge or is? Um, so obviously, as a small brand, we, we always kind of set a plan that we were going to execute. So kind of, uh, I didn't have any huge expectation. I didn't have a lot of pressure from, from back home to, to make big numbers early on. So, um, so I had the time to develop um, as the market would let us uh, without with a very, very, very tiny budget and a very small me doing all the things. Um, so there wasn't really, um, I'm not going to say we haven't had challenges, but um, with allowing the growth to happen the way we did, um, it just kind of happened in a very organic, um, very natural way. And I, I think that that allowed us to grow the way we have. It's kind of like, obviously, the first few years I was t by myself. <laughs> I, I had the first employee at, uh, after two years, and he's actually still with me. Um, wow. But um, so there's challenges with, you know, import duties and shipments. And like we just had a container broken into things like that. But it's not like there hasn't been where banging the head against the wall or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, what I can hear from both of you, it's highly entrepreneurial. I mean, it's, um, we have a question from California as well, I think. Elma, do you have any questions that you want to ask to, to Petra and Daniel? Sure. So, of course, a lot of companies are wondering about the practicalities of, of things, of, of, you know, should you have your own warehouse um, in North America? Should you serve the country from Sweden? as well as personnel. How much can you do with your employees working directly from, from Sweden versus sending someone over? What are your thoughts and experiences in terms of those things? I go ahead in the studio first. OK, OK. Yes. Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. And I wish I had the correct answer, but I only have my version of it. But I think, at least for us, um, Entering the biggest outdoor market in the world is a tricky situation. If you don't have anyone locally like Hilleberg has, which I'm extremely jealous on. <laughs> so, so, so for us, it was all about how can we grow small and steady, long term and organic? And how can we be in control of everything? Because what I'm doing now together with, with all of the back office team here in Sweden is we're laying the foundation for the future in US and also Canada. So having me flying over back and forth, having all of those meetings, that hopefully gives the credibility to the buyers that they are not dealing with a distributor. They're not dealing with an independent sales rep that doesn't have the, the passion for the brand. Uh, and for us, that has been very successful. The growth has been slow but steady, and we're getting more and more requests due to this. Um, so th for, for us, it was all about making sure that we deliver the best form of service. And how do we do that? Well, most likely using one person, in this case me, uh, flying over back and forth. And yes, I have my conscience. So flying is not something that I really I love, but it's, it's part of the business. I, I need to do it, but I do mm. it as, as little as possible, of mm. course. Mm. Thank you. Petra, what do you say? I, uh, I, I agree. I've, I've seen a lot of people come over and, and partner with the wrong partner uh, where, you know, it fades out or, or use a warehousing option that only costs you money and a headache. Um, so obviously, ideally, you have it yourself. I think there is a lot that can be done from Sweden. Um, you don't have to set up a big warehouse, but you could also have another strategy of working you know, working directly with Amazon. I know that's a way we don't work with Amazon. I'm not going to preach for them. But, you know, that is one way of, of going to, to partner with a big retailer and have them do everything. Um, also, I do think that there are small brands that have done a similar journey that have room in their warehouse. We don't, but, um, but um, 
who you can partner with go together. You can get a visa for someone who has worked for over at least a year um, in the office in Sweden and come over and set up for uh, some time. And maybe if you choose two brands together, setting up together, uh, employees here are cheaper. Um, you can have them more temporary. Um, so there are a, there's a lot of flexibility that can that can be done. I mean, I was able to answer phones and and ship out catalogs and send out tents, you know, by myself for two years. It's very doable. It's kind of the, mm. that entrepreneurial spirit that you see mm. a lot in the U.S. It's, you know, it's kind of bootstrapping it uh, is very possible without huge costs. I mean. Many of the smaller companies we talk to see both both uh, Hoglos and Hilleberg as huge players with really big budgets. What advice for smaller companies with less resources? I mean, Daniel, go ahead. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. yes, our budget might be bigger than another brand, but our key market is not North America. Our key market is Europe. Mm. Uh, and so from a marketing perspective, we're investing way more into this region than we are in North America. So for me, uh, and I, th I think that Petra will have a similar answer, it's uh, all about building the brand locally, organic, and be super street smart. And that is something that in US is very appreciated. Mm. Uh, so you, in, in here, it's all about being flexible and do the things you can with the funds you have. So, I mean, pretty much everyone can buy a full page ad in outside magazine as long as you have the money. But will that equal to uh, a higher revenue with the retailers? I have no idea, right? So the, I think that the best recommendation is to work with the retailers you have more locally and invest your time and the budget you have, whatever it is, high and low, uh, to get their stoke level, you know, to, to increase their awareness regarding the brand. Make the retailers your ambassadors, because when they are your ambassadors, that is way cheaper from a cost perspective and they will talk with everyone they know in the industry, with their friends, with their family, etc. And then you have created someone, something that money can't buy. So that is my recommendation. Find the local heroes in the states, in the key locations where you want to play. Give them your time, if you have the time, of course, uh, and, and support them and, and feel, make them feel included in the progress of the brand. Uh, I think that, at least for us, has been working extremely well. And now we have a bunch of local product ambassadors in North America, including Canada, but we also have global ambassadors in the US that all started off on the same kind of path. So that's yeah. my recommendation. Great. Petra, what about you? What are your advice for, for smaller companies? with less resources. I, I was going to say, I, I agree with Daniel. However, I don't think that there's anyone that believes that we are a huge player with a big budget. Um, <laughs> if they do, they're actually very wrong. <laughs> that is completely not true. We are tiny with a tiny budget. Um, we So if you look at our competitors, which if you look at North Face, Mountain Hardware or anyone, what they spend in one ad is what I would spend in maybe two or three years in, one, mm. in, in advertising. So. Mm. Uh, with that in mind, um, very similar um, strategy that we never pay anyone to use our tents. Um, so um, the people that use them are very passionate about the brand. Uh, same thing with retailers. Uh, and again, it's a luxury position, but we only work with the retailers that come to us and really kind of beg to sell our products. Um, and that creates a loyal customer and they can mm. explain why they should buy our tents over something else. Mm. Um, and uh, I think nowadays you can do so much for free with social media uh, and video. So I think we have opportunities now as small brands with small budgets that uh, you didn't have before um, in a totally different. Um, so I think that's really great that we can all utilize and that's, again, it's similar across the markets. Thank you very much, Petra. And back to the studio and Daniel, I mean, what, I mean, what are your main focus areas in the North American market in the coming five years? Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, the world is in a situation 
that I have never experienced in my lifetime. Uh, first we had a pandemic and now we have the, uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine and that affects everyone and then we have inflation. We still have a massive backlog in the, in the production, right? So I think for us it's all about making sure that the current world situation get stable in one way or another. And a couple of years ago, uh, the outdoor market in Taiwan was over flooded. All brands wanted to enter Taiwan. So everyone invested a lot of money. They uh, had, the Taiwanese outdoor market had way too many products versus the demand for the products. So what we were seeing was that the Taiwanese market was decreasing quite rapidly. And it, it has been taking a lot of years for that market to get stable and up and running again. And I think uh, with the US market, all brands have been wanting to enter US because that is the big golden country. You know, if you're successful in US, then you're good to go, right? Yeah. But at the same time, there are so many brands, there are so many products and pretty much everyone is saying similar stuff. My products is better than yours, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think my biggest recommendation to, to everyone who wants to enter US at this stage, uh, please think long term. Always count in what are the possible consequences. No one knew that we were ent entering a pandemic. No one knew that we were, uh, that we were seeing this uh, war from uh, Russia and Ukraine and, and the backlog on production is massive. Mm -hmm. So I think we need Everyone needs to have a lot of patience. And yes, the inflation in, in the US is still quite low versus here in Sweden. Will it happen in the US? I don't know. Uh, but I think patience is key. And that is what for us, uh, we are still uh, very grateful for the last year and all of what the years during the pandemic gave to the outdoor industry, right? It was booming. But is that healthy for the next coming five years? I think now we just need to sit calm and steady in the boat, be very smart and clever with the investment to make sure that we get the return of the investment back. So to answer your question, um, have faith in the future and be patient before we do anything stressful, no ad hoc solutions. Mm. I mean, uh Petra, what do, you what do you say about the stamina and uh, the entrepreneurial spirit in the next five years to come? So we'll continue doing what we've been doing. So again, um, having that long-term plans, we're still old school going with five-year business plans uh, every year and budgets. Um, my main focus is to increase capacity. Uh, we have had orders uh, three times more than what we can produce. Um, but... Um, and we were able to uh, deliver pretty much everything that was ordered throughout the pandemic. And that was uh, thanks to good and very close contacts with our um, suppliers. So continue taking care of our suppliers, our, our factory, and, uh, and also our retailer who maybe didn't get exactly what they wanted when the demand was huge. And same with customers. So we just continue doing what we have been doing and, and um, you know, continue trying to do the very best that we can in all aspects throughout the business. I mean, we touched upon a little bit when it comes to advice and so on. I mean, what are you, starting off in the studio, then, what are your most, I mean, three most important tips for Swedish brands who have not yet tried the North American market yet? Yeah, uh, uh, the first one is uh, uh, figure out what you can offer that the current brands can't. If that's quality on your products, if it's fit, if it's the heritage, if it's the sustainability, figure out your narrative, right? And then when you've figured that one out, see how that resonates with the US customer. And how can you figure that one out? Well, you need to travel around, you need to meet people, you need to talk with other people like David from SOG to see what, what kind of strategies are other brands using. Uh, so I think that is my first recommendation. Uh, the second recommendation is to, when you have de decided on that, stick to it, be consistent, do not change. So I rather see that you invest more time in the business strategy. And I love hearing about the five-year business plan. Uh, that's brilliant, I would say. So that is the same here, that 
spend more time on making sure that you have not a bulletproof business plan, but as good as it gets. Because when you enter US, you're going to meet a lot of retailers with a lot of high, low demands, different direction, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So trying to figure out your business plan and, and stick to it is the, is the second one. And, and then the third one is be street smart in marketing. You don't need to overinvest. Go locally, use the spirit of the brand that you're representing and believe in the brand and the quality that you stands for. And then maybe 10 years along the way, you have built up the, the budget that you can invest similar to what the North Face are doing on their tents in, in ads, or you end up not doing that. For us, it's all about building the credibility with local events to talk with the end consumer, because at the end of the day, it's the end consumer that pays for your products. Sure. Uh, the buyer is representing a retailer, but the buyer isn't paying the product, uh, buying the product for themselves. It's the end consumer. So you need to speak to the end consumer in a way that attracts them and get their awareness. That's Thank the, you. the three, great, <laughs> three ones. Great, great, insightful answers. What about you, Petra? Three top, um, so three I actually top com advices. Completely, yeah, I actually completely agree with Daniel, but I'm also going to say as a, um, just to give a, a different side of, of part of what he said um, <laughs> so that people don't get overwhelmed thinking that they're going to have to travel the country all <laughs> over. Um, I actually barely ever travel in the country. Um, uh, and again, that is because um, of that strategy of selling direct first. So I think for some, uh, depending on what your product is, for some uh, brands and some product, that is, um, it is okay to do that. You don't have to feel like you need to be in every corner of the country at, at the same time. Um, so I actually don't, I still don't, I barely ever travel around. Um, again, it's a luxury position to be in, but just as a side note, uh, but I think I agree this. They could say, focus on your target audience. I was just talking to a brand the other day and they had gotten a lot of different advice of like REI is the best or, you know, so-and-so you have to be an REI, otherwise you're not in the market. And I disagree with that. I think that if you know your target audience, um, and where you can focus in on, you can do that in so many other ways and being in a big retailer that is going to take your margins. Um, I always I have a saying that I like, um, the goal is to keep the goal the goal. And I think that's really good that it's you need to be focused on what you're doing. Um, and then keep a really good eye and, and control of your partner that you're working with and whether that's a distributor or however you decide to set it up. I have seen a lot of companies that basically they, they find a distributor and then they leave it and don't really, they're not really invested in, in making sure that that's going well. So I think that's important. Uh, and then I also, uh, as an advice, I think don't overthink it. It's yes, it's a different country. It's a different market, different people, but your product is your product and people are people and needs are needs no matter where you are. So don't overthink it. True. Very inspirational answer, Petra. Before we leave this open floor with questions, I would like to ask Elma uh, if you have any more additional questions. No, but I, I totally agree with um, both Hagios and Hilla Berry here for the advice. If I were to give one from my end, it would be that North America, we all often talk about it being a huge market. It really is. There is a lot of players, but the outdoors segment is still relatively small. People know each other, people do have the right contacts and can refer you. So building that trust early on as you enter is a huge advice that I wanna send, send off with as well. And how to build that trust? Well, sometimes it's about having someone in the same time zone that can take calls. Sometimes it's making it easy to, to make payments for you. Uh, but it's also about that commitment long term that both Petra um, mentioned earlier as well, where like if they know that you're going to be there long term, uh, that is going to make, make it so much easier for you to sign those first contracts as well. Great insights, Elma. Thank you very much. Um... I mean, I just want to high five. I mean, all of you who have been here uh, and let's do this. Yes. Thank you very much. I mean, really inspirational. And I mean, thank you all for coming and uh, that you've shared your stories and tips. Very inspiring indeed. 
Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of today's hour, but already on March 21st, we will have our second webinar that will guide you on how to work with partners in the US and Canada. So to get us, together with us the 21st of March, we'll have uh, Matt Huff with Hansa Sport, which is a distributor, distributor specialized on helping European speci speciality brands in the US and will share his experiences of helping uh, Hultzbruch succeed in the US and what to think about when searching for a distributor. And also Gustav from Omnia will join us to tell us about their experiences from the US and the importance of sales reps. And I also know that you have uh, more exciting things planned ahead, right Elma? No, we're doing a two to three year pro program right now with outdoors being a focus area for us. So apart from this webinar series, we are also planning matchmaking sessions, uh, having a group of uh, for a network group for those that are interested in continuing the collaboration and sharing advice, uh, as well as a retailer buying trip to, to Sweden uh, planned for later this summer. So we are always super interested in, in helping you out with whatever uh, of these activities that you might be interested in. And uh, let's continue the discussion, Sweden. Um, one thing that I've noticed is people in this industry are so happy and uh, to help out others. And I really like to see that because we are a small country. The US is big enough for all of us. Uh, so continue all of that. Thank you much. That's a wrap.